This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. On the last episode, we traveled to Ethiopia. Today, we're taking another trip, this time to northern Spain, to a place called Atapuerca, a place that can tell the entire story of human evolution in Europe with a complete cast of characters and twists and turns that are more dramatic and mysterious than an Agatha Christie novel. Before we get into it, a content note, this episode contains descriptions of prehistoric violence, including cannibalism. Uh, Atapuerca, it's a unique place because when we are talking about Atapuerca, we are not talking about only one side. Indeed, we are talking about a hill that hides the mystery of all the hominin species that inhabited Europe from the last 1.2 million years to present time. So it's not only one side, it's not only a one hominin species. We are talking about several localities that are providing us the biological evidence, the cultural evidence, the fauna, the landscape of the hominins that inhabited for such a long period uh, the European continent. This is Leaky Foundation grantee Maria Martignon Torres. She's a paleoanthropologist who's been a member of the Atapuerca research team since 1998. And she's director of the National Research Center on Human Evolution in Burgos, Spain, just 15 kilometers away from the fossil sites of Atapuerca. She says this collection of sites is a magic place, like a book that holds the entirety of human history in Europe. We have the oldest hominin that has been found so far in Europe, that is dated to 1.2 million years old at Cima del Elefante site. We have another locality, which is Grandolina at the T6 level. We have found a hominin sample of at least nine individuals that have been assigned to a new hominin species, Homo antecessor. We have then another locality, which is Cima de los Huesos, that has one of the largest accumulations ever found from the same locality that belongs to a population that lived about 430,000 years ago. It's at least 28 individuals that belong to a group that probably are like ancestors of Neanderthals. And then we have many different localities that are providing like the archaeological, cultural evidence of these hominins. And only very recently, we have the only hominin we were sort of of missing in Atapuerca, which were Neanderthals by themselves. And just a few years ago, we started working in a new locality and we found the parietal bone. It's a fragment of the head of possibly a Neanderthal. So we really have all the hominin species that were living in the European continent in the same physical locality. Maria sometimes describes herself as a detective of the dead because she uses her experience in medicine and forensic anthropology to ask questions and piece together the stories of our ancestors from the clues they left behind. I always like uh, questions. I love questions. I love uh, mystery novels. I, 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 I always say like scientists like more the questions than the answers. And I think that's the way we should be moving. Like, posing new questions. So I always like human origins and I always like fossils and trying to, to understand what we were. And well, the funny part is that my, my degree is in medicine uh, because I thought, okay, if I really want to go back in time and understand how humans were, maybe I should understand better how humans now we work, how we are made of, how we change, how, yeah, you know, like the insides of the machine, you know, I really want to understand humans now. And then is when I can really go backwards in time and try to understand how we change. So... Uh, I studied medicine, then I will jump into the world of human evolution with a master's in paleoanthropology, and here I am, like with this type of patients that do not complain. <laughs> uh, it's also true that they don't collaborate and they don't tell you what happened, but well, they have a lot of stories, so it's our challenge to make them speak. The place where Maria works to make these ancient people speak is the Center for Human Evolution Research Facility in Burgos. This center is equipped with state-of-the-art imaging and microscopy equipment that makes it possible for Maria and her colleagues to make sense of the thousands and thousands of hominin and animal fossils and stone tools they've recovered. So last year, we asked local producer Lucia Benavides to visit Maria Martignon Torres and take us on a behind-the-scenes tour, starting with the lab. Hola. 
Hola. So this is the microscopy lab. So we really have here a wide variety of different microscopy techniques. The micro CT, as I told you, we have a electron microscope, we have a confocal microscope. So all ways of getting images, images from outside and images from inside. And these type of techniques have a, a wide range of applications in many, many different fields. In particular, for us, for anthropology, it's very important for the study of fossils. For us, it was particularly useful, for example, to study the internal structure of the teeth, for example, that we found in Sima del Elefant, as you can see here. In this case, we have a, a tooth uh, that belong to an individual, the one from Sima Elefante, the oldest hominin we have so far in Europe. Is that the tooth that you found? Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly That's that tooth. tooth. Yeah, so we really are in love with him. You know, we know him from outside and from inside. And we really, I, I, somehow I say that with this type of techniques, we undress the teeth, you know? We really like to see them. We remove everything outside and we see everything in the inside. <laughs> In addition to the microscopy and imaging labs where they undress the fossils and teeth, they have labs with equipment for all kinds of dating techniques used to place the former inhabitants of Arapuerca in time. They also have spaces for fossil preparation and conservation. This is a very beautiful fossil of a kid. At the beginning, uh, you couldn't see anything. This came as a block, as a block of, of sand, of soil, and this is like, as I said, bringing alive something slowly, slowly. So Pilar was really working here, cleaning, and a lot of things are coming out. So we can really see here the little mandible that we are really discovering the fossil of a kid. Yeah. Their comparative collections contain a vast array of animal bones and fossil casts that help them identify the new fossils they find. Hola. So this is the comparative anatomy lab. So here, as you can see, well, we have all these guys looking at us from the past. <laughs> and their skulls? Yeah, or? and different animals. So it's so important to contextualize what you have. If not, you don't have a story, you don't have plots, you don't have a beginning, you don't have an end, you don't have a temporal sequence, yeah? Here we have a good representation of all the key hominins, which are very important for us to compare with our fossil, with our original fossil samples. But we have this for hominins, and we also have this for animals. That's a bit of a detective work, it's like, what this little bone belonged to. Not always that easy. You know, it's like seeing, say like if you fly to another planet and you go to Mars and you find for the first time an intelligent or a human, let's call it from Mars, here's a bit the same. You are for the first time meeting someone from a period you don't know how they look like. Like an UFO, you know, someone is coming from another planet. In a way, this is the same for us. Have nothing to compare. No, to exactly. So then you start with the detective work. Okay, looks more like us, looks more like uh, Australopithecus, looks more like Homo habilis. You know, then all the research starts first, the finding, and then questions. The place where they do the finding is only a short drive from the research center. Um, okay, so explain to me where we are and where we're going. We're in the car on our way to Atapurca. Atapurca sites are about like 15, 16 kilometers away from the historical city of Burgos. That's where we were, the Tenier, in the research center. And here to your left, you can see already the beautiful magic hill. This is the Sierra de Atapurca. The landscape, as you see, is completely different. So we're really entering a new world. Yes, you really leave the city behind. The landscape is a spreading patchwork of fields that glow green or deep brilliant gold depending on the season. The Sierra de Arapuerca rising gently above the plain. The mountain isn't very tall. It's only around a thousand meters above sea level. And along the road, you see hikers and pilgrims who are walking the Camino de Santiago, a network of trails that connect Christian religious sites throughout Spain. The earliest record of the Camino de Santiago dates to the 9th century. The Sierra de Arapuerca sites have been known since the end of the 19th century, 
and modern systematic excavations began there in 1978. Maria spends her summers working there as part of a large multidisciplinary and international team. Um, we come to this landscape. I love this landscape. I love this place. I love this sound, even the sound of the gravel, because this, this is part of it. So we are entering now the, the tunnel of time. Connected caverns were buried inside the hill, and animals like lions, saber-toothed cats, rhinos, and hippos roamed the area, hunted by the ancient humans who lived here. Now, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, open to tour groups. Yeah, we are just arriving to the entrance, and then I will show you here. This is the entrance to the main railway trench uh, sites. And so we are going to park here. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we'll go. We'll go. Yeah. Past the tourist parking area and through a place where a railway once ran, you enter the archaeological sites. They're no longer underground caverns. Most are now open to the sky. And they're lined with scaffolding to make them safe and accessible for the scientists and the tourists. As you can see here, we have to the left, this is already like rock part of the wall of the cave. You can see you have wall and rocks to your side, this is limestone, and to your right. So this is like a little corridor, so we are indeed crossing the cave, yeah. And what did this look like back in the day? Well, probably this part of the cave was like this. So this is the place where things in somehow remain intact. <laughs> yeah, that's the magic of excavating. You are touching something that was not touched until you arrive. In front of you is the Simon Elephant site, something that was not touched for one million years. I always think that there is something like frozen. There is something that became permanent but was not meant to be. So it, it, like if you leave a room and you leave a rock just behind you, well, it was not a special movement. You just left something there, maybe thinking of coming back in a while. But you never do. And that remains in that exact position for one million years. So when you come here and you take that stone out of the place. I think there's something magic in this mixture of the time and, and this is what you have here. So we're walking through a place that it was like this a million years ago when everything was buried. If you look at the wall here, you see what we call the stratigraphic layers. You have like the different layers of sediment that have been laid time over time. It's a bit like a cake. You, you see that the wall is not uniform. You have like different changes in color and the thickness of the different materials that are in the wall that are reflecting different episodes. Each layer is a different moment in time and a different story. Within these layers, they've found thousands of artifacts and fossils, all of them with stories to tell. Some of the stories are sweeping dramas that explore big questions about human evolution. And some of them are grisly mysteries, more like a CSI crime scene. We're going to hear three of those stories today. The first is a happy one that takes place at Cima de la Fonte, a site that's been dated to around 1.2 million years old. And there is this place that is 1.2, 1.4 million years. As you can see, the floor of the cave was had a strong inclination. And in that level, T9, this is the level where we have found the earliest hominin ever found in, in Europe, 1.2, 1.4 million years. That discovery in Cima d'Elefante happened in 2007, and it was a huge surprise. The site had already given lots of important clues about the ancient environment through the many animal fossils found there. They had even picked up the trail of possible hominid presence because some of the bones had what appeared to be cut marks on them. And who could make cut marks? humans. And we were also having some stone tools, but those were very basic, very primitive. So well, the scientific community is skeptical because they will say, well, maybe this is just a rock that broke naturally in a funny shape and looks like a tool, but it's not a tool. Maria was excavating nearby when someone called her over to show her something. And since her specialty is teeth, teeth are usually what people want to show her. She went over not expecting much. And I will never ever forget this uh, moment, this emotion, because I really saw it and 
and and I just jump and I say, yes, it is human. This is unbelievable. We are talking about, again, having the oldest hominin remains in Europe. This is 1.2. This is more than we ever thought that we could get in this place. We, I would have never expected that we could find hominin remains in Encima del Elefante. So we all were celebrating and like so happy and toasting and calling politicians that were coming to celebrate to decide the discovery of the oldest human in Atapuerca. And well, uh, at the time, uh, after a while, people come and say, are you sure? This is unbelievable. And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, it's human. And then he says, but are you sure? It's so strange that you have found humans in this site. And then, you know, you start feeling sick, thinking, oh my goodness, just imagine this was not human. And everybody's celebrating now already. I'm going to have to change career. I'm going to leave the country. I really have to start doing something else. And at that time, I just finished my PhD indeed I was like all these years for nothing what a big mistake so I perfectly remember all the anguish at that moment and I was really like looking forward to to see Jose Maria Jose Maria Bermudez de Castro was my supervisor it was my mentor my colleague now my friend and I was really like desperate like please Jose Maria come and and and, and look at this with me and and I remember he came and and he he saw the tooth and he's like yes it is so I felt so relieved and I say you did well come on all these years you were working you know what you were doing and don't even worry because in a few days I'm sure that we're gonna find the mandible where this tooth fits and that's it only a few days later we appear at the mandible which became a cover in, in nature. So it was the first European, the mandible of an individual that, well, was clearly the, the, the oldest hominin in Europe. And, well, it has been very interesting. This individual was the oldest hominin in Europe by a lot. It radically shifted the timeline, a timeline that had already been significantly shifted thanks to a discovery from another site in Atapuerca called Grandolina, where several years earlier in the 90s, they found fossils from a species that they thought at the time was the first in Europe. You see at the back, well, I would say that's the queen so far of, of Atapuerca, which is the, the Grandolina site. It is very characteristic, probably you saw already, that Atapuerca has these very big scaffold uh, structures for each site, so it's part of, of the landscape too. And Grandolina is very special because uh, all the 10 levels that go from TD10 on top to TD1, we have some type of record. Either the animals, the plants, the stone tools of the different hominids in the different periods. So it's very rich from the same spot in the same place. So I think it's quite of a, a magic <laughs> circumstance. Yeah. So let's go. Everybody who comes to Tabaka should go through this scaffold. Perfect. And yes, I will follow you. Yes, we are gonna like walk up in time. Yes. Before the Atapuerca sites, we thought that there was no any hominin presence in Europe until only half a million years ago. When the Atapuerca sites were discovered, particularly the site of Grandolina, that was a very big surprise because we found at the Grandolina site, at the TD6 level, a hominin accumulation that was 860,000 years. So that was really pushing back very early the first evidence of hominin presence in Europe, almost too close to one million years. That was a big surprise. And usually you say, who are these guys that seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Well, humans doing here, where they come from. So a lot of new questions arise thanks to the Atapuerca fossils. When the team found these fossils in Grandolina, they got to work, trying to learn more about who these guys were. They did a detailed anatomical study of all the hominin fossils they found, about 80 of them, with all the skeletal parts represented bones from at least nine individuals. And like I said, Maria's specialty is teeth. Her comparative studies often focus on them. I, I love teeth, you know. I, I always say that people prefer to find skulls. Of course, they are easy to see, to understand, but you know, teeth are like diamonds, you know. It's like you have all the, the, the jewelry of the crown around the teeth because in such a small space, in such a small diminutive, tiny little thing, there's so much information. I always say that 
teeth are like landscapes in miniature. So you can really read on those mountains and valleys and groves and things. You really can read a lot of stories. Every single feature we look at are teeth in their shape, the cusp, the position of the caps to regard to each other, little accessory tubercles and crests. All of them are inherited genetically. So it's very interesting because the, the way these features are arranged can be very typical and even exclusive of a hominin species. And we were analyzing in these hominins comparing to any other hominin species we knew before. And we got a surprise because on one hand, uh, the Grandolinatidae 6 hominins were having very primitive teeth. And this is something that was not that surprising if you take into account the age. We were talking about hominins that were like 860,000 years. So what do you expect? That they should have primitive features in their teeth. So this very robust, very large, very complicated occlusal surfaces, the root system, everything was like fitting the time. But the team was very surprised to find that these teeth were matched with a modern-looking flat face like the faces we all have today. This flat face is a defining characteristic of our species. I think that Homo sapiens is the known face hominin. We are really very flat faces, and you know, that, so the, the, the part of the face, the cheeks are like vertical, even a bit depressed. So I always say that in a way our modern faces are a bit of a retro vintage design, you know? We are wearing something that was a fashion already one million years ago. This was the first time this combination of features very primitive teeth with a very modern face, appear in the fossil record. It was unlike anything seen before, and that's why the Atapuerca research team decided to name a new species, a new member of our family, which they called Homo antecessor. So Homo antecessor is a name that's playing a little bit with the word ancestor. But antecessor is also the name the Roman legions gave to the soldier that goes ahead of the troops finding the way the rest of the group should follow. So we thought that, yeah, Omantefeso was the first explorer in Europe, the one who was really opening the gates of Europe for the rest of the humankind in, to come. So this was quite interesting because it was really the, the very first beginning of the Europeans' history. But also, apart from the history, the one we would say the big history with capital letters, we also have some stories human stories, which is so important. We're talking about people after all. We cannot forget that these are our ancestors and, well, this is the, the roots of, of humankind. And the story these ancient people had to tell is a strange and shocking one. One that Maria's background in medicine and forensics made her particularly suited to uncover. When Maria and the Atapuerca team were analyzing the fossils, they soon realized that all the bones were quite broken, and all of them had marks from tools. Particularly the bones where the muscles and tendons attach. They all showed evidence of having been dismembered, chopped up, and broken while they were still fresh. There were marks where people had scraped to get at the marrow inside. Maria said this was quite dramatic. These people, these very early Europeans, were cannibals. And this was quite dramatic. It's dramatic because, of course, uh, well, it's humans eating humans. It's something that scares us, like why we should be eating humans. And, of course, when we think about eating, the first thing we see is that, okay, we were hungry and... And this is what we thought at the beginning, and it's true that all the hominin remains had the same pattern of, of breakage and marks that the faunal animals that were mixed with the hominins were. So we didn't identify any special treatment, so we thought that, okay, this is what we call gastronomic cannibalism. It's just for nutritious purposes. They were hungry, they need to eat, and they're just trying to access all the, all the meat, all the, the things that really give proteins and, and the things they need at that time. But it was not that simple, because uh, on one hand, when we analyze all the fauna that was recovered together with the hominids, we see that it was very rich. So these hominids really had access to 
a large amount and very diverse sample of animals at that time. As I would say, like the fridge was full. There was no need to eat humans at that time. We also know by the paleoclimatic reconstruction that we're talking about a period that was quite warm and mild. So it doesn't look like living in a period that is hard with very difficult conditions. But especially what was more striking is that when we study the fossil sample, we realize that most of the individuals were children. And children, well, you know, they are not particularly nutritious. They don't really have all the things we really need. And even if you say that they were, like, tasty, I, come on. It, you know, children are very expensive in the hominin species. Humans, we really have to invest a lot of energy to raise a child. We are a species that our offspring is immature for a very long time. We need to be providing a lot of food and resources to allow that those big brains to grow. So it wouldn't make sense to raise children to eat them. The clues to this mystery didn't quite add up. And a few years later, they found more evidence. They found the area where the fossils were discovered was made up of four sublayers, with broken bones in all of them, which means this wasn't an isolated event. It was something these people did for a long time. It seemed to be part of their culture, possibly a horrifying way to attack competing groups by preying on their children. It's interesting to think that, okay, maybe at that time there was a um, big number of groups and they were competing for resources and they need to defend themselves. And in a way, the, the most devastating way of hurting another population is by killing their offspring. It's very difficult to recover if you really have kids and they kill them. There's no generation renewal there. So we think that maybe this is the working hypothesis we have now is that it was a type of cultural cannibalism, maybe to defend the territory or to defend the group in the in the most cruel way we could think at that time. So I think this is a side that makes us think about our nature, our behavior, about competition in, in the early Pleistocene, long time ago. So that's a pretty um, bleak picture, like a harsh picture of early human life in Europe. Is there, do the other sites have similar stories? Or? Well, the good thing is that uh, in Atapuerca we have another site that I would say that is the story that is telling us is less sour. <laughs> and that site is Cima de los Huesos. Cima de los Huesos is an amazing place. In English, Cima de los Huesos means pit of bones, and it's a very small cavity, only about six by eight square meters. But in such a small, tiny place, uh, we have recovered about 6,500 fossils so far, and it keeps going, so it's not finished yet, that uh, provide evidence for a population. It is at least 28 individuals have been identified so far. And here, the story we have is radically different. When you study the accumulation, we have whole bodies there. When we study the marks they have, how they have been accumulated, the geology, the stratigraphy of the site, the, the most plausible hypothesis we have to explain this accumulation in this case is that it was probably an intentional disposal of bodies by other hominins. So in this case, we're seeing a quite different behavior. In Grandolina, hominins were eating each other. And in this case, we think that humans were putting the corpses aside somewhere else. Is this a burial? Well, maybe we cannot talk about a burial in the sense we understand burials nowadays. We cannot say that these guys were really like digging a hole and putting bodies there, but they're putting bodies aside. They are taking the bodies of those who died and put them away from their daily places of living, which I think is quite an important difference in terms of behavior. Another clue that led the researchers to think this was an intentional disposal of bodies comes from a very special artifact found among the thousands of bones. One tool 
a single stone hand axe that had never been used, a beautiful tool made of red and green quartzite. It's entirely different from any of the tools found at any other site in Arapuerca. This hand axe is very different. We have named this hand axe Excalibur just to highlight how special it is. And we think that, okay, maybe this could be like a hint, a clue, perhaps to a type of ritual, like offering this very special tool to the group that die. The accumulation is mostly of uh, young adults. We have men, we have women, we have children, but mostly we have uh, young adults. So maybe there was a battle or something that happened that a large number of them die. And perhaps this Excalibur was uh, offered to them as a special memory or ritual or who knows. So I think in that sense, we would be looking at maybe one of the earliest evidences of some type of... Uh, after death behavior, who knows? So I think, well, at least Atapurka is giving us the two extremes of the of the human behavior in our roots. And okay, we can tell many different stories uh, about us in a way. In addition to the evidence of caring for the dead, the individuals recovered so far from Cima de los Huesos have more to say about how humans behave. Yes, the good thing is that uh, we have about 20 individuals, we have up to 17 skulls, so each of them is a person that has a story behind. So indeed, the, the people from Cima de los Huesos, we know them by the name. We have a name f- for them because each of them is telling us a, a different story. There is one very special to us, is a skull of a little girl that uh, died when she was nine years old. We call her Benjamina, which means the beloved one. And this little girl has a skull that is deformed. It's not normal. And Benjamina suffered what we call craniosynostosis. Craniosynostosis means that one of the sutures that we have in the skull, when the bones need to get fused to each other, was closed before time in such a way that the head could not keep growing proportionally in all parts properly. So there is one part of your head that does not grow properly because it's already closed before time. So she got a deformed head, is what we call in her case a plagiocephaly. This is important. Why is it important? First, because she has a deformity. We are talking about a little girl half a million years ago that was having a deformity, quite obvious in the, in the head and in the face. But it is also important at another level. If your skull is not growing properly, if there is one part of your skull that because it is closed before time is not expanding as it should, it's giving promise to the structures in the inside to grow. So it means that the brain is having also some compression, some difficulties to, to really develop normally. And despite that, she survived until the age of nine years old. And this is a beautiful, indirect way of thinking that hominins at that time may have compassion. They may have uh, feelings towards people that were disabled, that were having problems. And I think, well, it's, it's good to see this very early signs of what sentence we think is what makes us human. No? This type of behaviors and high feelings of, of taking care of the elderly and the disabled. So Benjamina would be a little girl that is telling us a special story uh, about that. These hominins in Cima de los Huesos, who lived and died 430,000 years ago, have been identified as the ancestors of Neanderthals. What we have in Cima de los Huesos is very important because we have one of the uh, sites with the earliest clear evidence of Neanderthal morphology. We are talking about a site that is 430,000 years old, and in this side, we have a population of 28 individuals, and they already show all the features we would expect a Neanderthal to have. So the Cima de los population is really at the root of the Neanderthal lineage. So we can really study the, the origin of our sister species, the one that got extinct in a place like Cima de los Huesos. But it's very interesting because it's telling us that, yes, that Neanderthals have deep roots in Europe, at least 430,000 years ago, but probably the story was not very lineal. 
Because Simodorus Wessos population has all the traits we expect a Neanderthal to have, but also has some features that are quite special in their own. For example, has very small posterior teeth. They have very small teeth that could be almost as small as the ones that modern humans have. Or, for example, they have quite of a high cranial vault, which is not typically found in Neanderthals or pre-Neanderthals. So they are unique in some aspects. They are very Neanderthals in some others. And when you compare Cima de los Huesos to other populations of similar age, we see that their degree of Neanderthalization or how Neanderthal they are is not uniform. So we cannot see a progression from less Neanderthal to more Neanderthal across time. We really see like a bouquet of different Neanderthal populations, but some of them are more Neanderthal in their face, some of them are more Neanderthal in their teeth. So I think it's very interesting because it's telling us that evolution of Neanderthals was not lineal. Uh, Cima de los Huesos is uh, unique because we were quite certain about this relationship with Neanderthals because it's morphology. But we were able of recovering a type of evidence that, okay, we never thought we could. I always said that when they tell me if, okay, if one day, what would you love to ask or to get from a fossil sample like Sima? I would say DNA. Okay, uh, that was not science. I always thought that was science fiction and that happened. Sima de los Huesos has provided the earliest uh, DNA ever recover from a non-permafrost context. So we have nuclear and mitochondrial DNA of 430,000 years. So also in that aspect, that Atapuerca is unique. This DNA has uh, ratified what we knew is that uh, Sima de los Huesos hominins are very closely related to Neanderthals, but there is still we have some questions open. Does it mean that they are already Neanderthals? Can we call them early Neanderthals? Are they just a sister species of Neanderthals and they should deserve their own species or subspecies name? So there's still a lot of questions to, to answer, especially from a taxonomical point of view. But we are very clear that we are looking really at the roots of, of the origins of Neanderthals. When we say that the, the fossils in Sima are very well preserved in all means, because it's not only that they are very complete and they have a lot of information in terms of morphology, but they also preserve the DNA, which is something, given the age, that is very, very, very impressive. Do you ever think it will be possible to get DNA from some of the older sites? Do you have hope for that? I think that if there is a place that makes me think that dreams can come true is Atapuerca. So we did that with the Grandolina TD6 fossils that we were beating the age of the earliest hominin fossils. We did that with the Cima del Elefante site, which we were providing again the earliest hominin fossil evidence that existed in Europe 1.2 million years ago. We made it with the DNA. So now, well, I'm ready to, to keep dreaming. Why not? We don't lose. We have to keep searching our dreams and Atapuerca is definitely a magic place. Since the time we conducted these interviews, that dream of getting DNA from older sites has come true. Just a few months ago, Leakey Foundation grantee Frido Velker and colleagues were able to pull ancient proteins from an 860,000-year-old tooth from Grandolina. These proteins have provided the oldest genetic information ever retrieved. Their results, published in the journal Nature in April 2020, provide evidence that Homo antecessor is a close sister species to us, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. This implies that the modern-like face of Homo antecessor may have a very deep ancestry in our genus, Homo. Research continues at Arapuerca, and when people are able to travel again, Maria invites you to visit and experience Arapuerca for yourself. Thanks to Maria Martignon Torres for sharing her work. There are links in your show notes to learn more. Big thanks as well to Dub and Ginny Crook for generously sponsoring this episode and for their constant support of the Leakey Foundation and Dr. Maria Martignon Torres' work. If you'd like to support this show and the science we talk about, make a donation to the Leakey Foundation today. All donations will be matched, so your impact will be doubled. 
Visit leakyfoundation.org slash donate. That's L-E-A-K-E-Y foundation.org slash donate. This episode was produced by me and Lucia Benavides with Shuka Kalantari. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Theme music by Henry Nagel. Additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevere. We'll have another episode about Maria in Spanish coming soon, so watch your feeds. And thanks to all of your donations, we're rolling out lesson plans that go along with every episode of Origin Stories. The first batch will be posted in early September. You'll be able to find them at leakyfoundation.org lessons. As always, thanks for listening.